I, 28 female, lost weight and now I want to divorce my husband, 29 male. We've been married for five years and together for seven. We also have a three-year-old kid. After having the baby, I struggled a lot with losing the baby weight and adjusting to being a parent. I also had the baby blues at first, which was tough. I wasn't really focused on my appearance and instead I was trying to figure out our new routine and way of life. But then my husband started making these little comments about my body and how I should start working out and wearing makeup again. It made me feel really awful and I worried that he might start looking elsewhere because we weren't being intimate anymore. He even suggested hiring a nanny so I could have more time for myself but I wanted to be there for our baby full time so I turned down the offer. That made him angry and he started acting cold towards me. Months went by without any hugs, kisses, romance or any kind of affection. My self-esteem hit rock bottom. Every time I looked in the mirror, all I saw were the flaws that my husband pointed out. By this point, our son was already two years old and I desperately wanted to win my husband back. I thought if I got into shape again, he would show me love and affection and our marriage would be saved. I craved his attention so much and it hurt to see how much things have changed. But you can't force someone to be affectionate. I took matters into my own hands and hired some help. With more free time, I started going to the gym, taking swim classes, getting my hair and lashes done regularly, and eating healthier. And guess what? I've lost a ton of weight and I feel amazing. Suddenly, my husband started touching me, kissing me, buying me flowers, and treating me like the complete opposite of how he treated me before. You'd think that would make me feel better, but for some reason, it made me feel worse. All I could think about were the hurtful things he said to me when I was at my lowest and how cold he was towards me. I get that you can't force attraction, but why couldn't he just hug me or give me a kiss on the cheek even when I was overweight? Why couldn't he love me as a human being and the mother of his child? When my self-esteem came back, I got really angry at myself for putting up with his behavior for so long. A few days ago, I told him I wanted a divorce because I don't think I can move past how badly he treated me. He apologized and promised to change and prove that he can be better. But honestly, I'm not sure if I can trust him again. What if I gain weight again or have to deal with health issues? Will he treat me like garbage again? I've talked to some friends and family about the whole situation and some say I should give him another chance while others say I should leave him. Am I being justified in being upset over this? Do you think it's possible for my husband to change his behavior for the long term or is a divorce the right move here? Am I wrong for CCing all of the family, friends, and coworker after my husband divorced me via email? I, 47 female, woke up yesterday morning to an email from my husband of 21 years, 50 male, entitled, Working Things Out. Very deceptive title because instead of arranging a meeting or even a phone call, my husband goes on all four paragraphs soapbox speech about how marriage is supposed to be for the most part, an in-person commitment and that it pains him to say this, but this cannot go on anymore. He goes on in a very clinical detached tone to describe how us not speaking for a week before our big fight and then not hearing from me for the week afterwards is abandonment for him so he's filing for divorce. I mean, he could have talked to you too. He then asked me to tell me what things of mine I wanted him to ship and that he wants to do things fairly via mediation. Also said he'd only be responding to calls regarding our daughter and to contact his lawyer for everything else. This is the straw that broke the camel's back for me. Because leading up to Thanksgiving, he's already been complaining that he's spending the holidays alone and it's all my fault. For a little context, I moved with my daughter, 16 female, from Kentucky to Atlanta three years ago because she wants to get into acting and singing. She's now attending a performing arts high school and trying to make a living acting. My husband was supportive at first. He sent in 60 applications to jobs in Atlanta. But even though he's been a manager at a motel for 13 years here, he only got entry-level interviews. My husband initially said there's FaceTime and he has airline points. But soon, I saw how inflexible he was. Every conversation was unbearable because if I picked his brain, I knew I'd be running into a brick wall. Instead of learning to enjoy long distance, it was like, fulfilling marriage, long distance, nope. He asked us to move back during the actor strike. At that time, we had already agreed that he could sleep with others as long as he fulfilled his other obligations. Hey yo! He agreed to our arrangement, but dumped the woman after a month and got more petty, saying the woman he wants wouldn't be into married men. What? <laughs> our final fight happened when I said we were going to have a virtual Thanksgiving with my mom and wish her recovery from her surgery. He said, why don't you come back and tell her in person? He also said instead of giving input over Christmas decorations to come back and do it in person. He said he had more intimacy with the escort than me because it was in person and I called him a hospitality manager stereotype, unable to adapt to any change and stuck in his path. The fury boiled over after his email and I replied and cc'd the extended family, friends who only hear from him and his side, and his coworker and friends of the family, just to tell them that the man who says he's a peacemaker is divorcing me over email and that he's been seeing other women and saying that his one month fling with an escort was more fulfilling. Am I wrong? My only regret is that a friend's kid got a hold of the email and I've had to shield my daughter and explain that her dad is divorcing me. 
Am I in the wrong for dropping off my kids with my in-laws and saying that they're not my problem anymore? My wife passed away just before last Thanksgiving. It came out of nowhere and I'm somewhat broken. To make it worse, my stepkids have decided that since I'm not their father, they don't have to obey me anymore. They're teens and have never been my biggest fans. They love their dad and I was only ever their mom's husband. However, when Dina was alive, they treated her home well and with respect. After she died, they became a-holes. Yes, I know their mom died. It sucks. But that was my wife and the mother of my children. I'm also having a tough time dealing. Their paternal grandparents are also shitting on me for not being more understanding of all they're going through. I've tried. I've offered them counseling. I have given them space. I have been there for them. I'm at my wit's end. The last straw was when we were over there for supper last week. I said it was time to go so I could get the littles to bed. My stepkids said that they didn't want to go and that I should leave them and come back for them. It's a two-hour drive. I said no. Their grandparents said I was being too hard on them and that I should let them stay. I'm having a hard time with two small children, the loss of my wife, and two teen a-holes without having my in-laws pile on my life to make it more difficult. So I did. I also packed up their stuff. Instead of coming back for them, I dropped off all of their stuff at their grandparents' house. I have two kids under five to take care of. I don't really have time to baby two teens that are just making my life harder. My house is clean for the first time in weeks. My kids are sleeping through the night. My stepkids are living with their uncle in the same city as me so they can finish high school with their friends. Everyone on their dad's side is against me. I really don't care. I was told by both of them and their father that I am not to try and parent them, so I'm not. I actually don't have any parental rights over them. Their dad wasn't even okay with me being a contact for them at school, so his parents bear the contact. My wife left behind a small life insurance policy which I'll divide between the four kids, but I was the breadwinner in my house. I bought pretty much everything for their last eight years, so now it's all mine. My in-laws are calling me an a-hole for abandoning the kids, but I have two kids that need me more. The older two have a dad as well as grandparents to help them. My kids do too, I guess, but they also have me, and I want them to have a peaceful home. Am I in the wrong for kicking my sister out for sleeping in my son's bed? My younger sister, 38, moved in with my family half a year ago after a horrific divorce. We've always been close, so I was more than happy to have her with us. I live with my husband, 45, son, 21, and daughter, 15. She slept in our guest room, or so I thought. My sister and son got really close bonding over a shared hobby, and obviously I thought nothing of it. I mean, how on earth could I? She held him as a baby, but early yesterday morning when I thought my son had gone to work, I went into his room to check something for renovations. They were there sleeping in his bed. I freaked out. I had the absolute worst feeling in my gut. She claimed that they were only sleeping, but her face was bright red and she was wearing this skimpy nightgown. I told her to get out and never come back. My son immediately started defending her, repeating that they were only sleeping and that I needed to stop being mean to her. In my anger, I told him to go with her. They're now out. I have no idea where. I've been a mess. My sister has nowhere to go besides her cheating ex-husbands who has moved his mistress in, but I can't get the image and feeling out of my head. My son refuses to come back if she won't be here. Says he'll go wherever she is. It's like he's in love. I'm so sick. But did I overreact? Am I in the wrong for keeping my brother and his fiance from my house after she made comments on my girlfriend's eating habits? I, 30 male, have been with my girlfriend Kelly, 29 female, for four years and I've known her for 10. Kelly is autistic and one of her biggest problems is food. However, since getting together with me, she's opened up to a lot of new foods. Just to give an example, she wouldn't eat certain vegetables as they are, but wouldn't mind having them blended in or cut in small pieces in spirals. Now, to my brother Kevin, 35 male, who's recently proposed to his girlfriend of three years, Laura. He mentioned he had some news to announce, and will I be okay to host a family dinner at my place since I love cooking? I said it wouldn't be a problem, and we decided on Japanese theme. Now to the issue. For the main dish, I made a ramen, including noodles and broth from scratch. It had to be chicken as Kelly doesn't really like beef or pork and also since my mother doesn't eat pork. For Kelly's portion only, I've added some extra veggies, zucchinis, carrots, sweet corn, and some others since she's not fond of eggs. So naturally, her ramen was served without an egg, while everyone else had a standard portion which is enough to fill up a grown man. I also made sure that there were some snacks on the table like tempura, yakitori, skewers, onigiri, etc. While within the first half hour of being there, Laura kept picking on Kelly and kept saying that she can't say that she likes ramen because her version is not authentic. None of us are Asian or have any ties to Asia if it matters which was upsetting to her and meant that Kelly started to eat significantly slower compared to the rest of the group. It happens when she gets anxious. Then, Laura tries some of Kelly's ramen to try and prove a point, so Kelly freaked out since she doesn't really like sharing food that's already on her plate. This resulted in an argument between Kelly and Laura and Kelly crying due to her being overwhelmed. After this, I asked my brother and Laura to leave. My parents were absolutely terrified over how Laura behaved towards Kelly and hinted that Laura should apologize. They ended up leaving, but later I have received a call from Kevin calling me in a hole for kicking them out and spoiling Laura's pregnancy reveal. He also wasn't happy about our mother scolding him over Laura's behavior. So, am I in the wrong? On January 15, 1947, the lifeless body of a 22-year-old aspiring actress is found in Lehman Park, Los Angeles, California. A mother walking with her two-year-old initially spotted it and thought it to be a mannequin until getting close enough to see that it was a woman's body, cut in half with a ghastly smile carved into her face. 
Elizabeth's short had been sliced in two, drained of blood, and some of her organs were removed then neatly placed underneath her. Pieces of flesh had been cut away from her thighs and breasts. Her stomach was full of feces, leading some to believe that she'd been forced to eat it before she was killed. The most chilling mutilations, however, were the lacerations on her face. The killer had sliced each side of her face from the corners of her mouth to her ears, creating what's known as the Joker smile. Her body had also been washed clean. Nearby, detectives noticed a heel print and a cement sack with traces of blood that had presumably been used to transport her body to the vacant lot. Short's fingerprints led detectives to find out she had applied for a job as a clerk at a commissary of the U.S. Army Camps Cook back in 1943 and an arrest for underage drinking just seven months before that. They posted her mugshot photo and the media went into a frenzy. Elizabeth Short's mother didn't learn of her daughter's death until reporters from the Los Angeles Examiner telephoned her pretending that Short had won a beauty contest. They pumped her for all the details that they could before revealing the terrible truth. Her daughter had been murdered and her corpse had been dismembered in unspeakable ways. The media began branding Short as a sexual deviant. One police report stated, This victim knew at least 50 men at the time of her death. At least 25 had been seen with her 60 days preceding her death. She was known as a teaser of men. They gave her the nickname Black Dahlia due to her reported preferences for wearing a lot of sheer black clothing. On January 21st, about a week after the body was found, the examiner received a call from someone claiming to be the murderer. They stated that they would send Short's belongings in the mail as proof of this claim. On the 24th, the examiner received a package with her birth certificate, photos, business cards, and an address book with the name Mark Hansen on the cover. Also, there was a letter pasted together from newspaper and magazine letter clippings that read, Los Angeles Examiner and the other Los Angeles papers, here is Dahlia's belongings letter to follow. All of the items had been wiped down with gasoline, leaving only a partial fingerprint behind on the envelope, but it was damaged during transport and never analyzed. Another letter arrives on January 26th. This time, it's a handwritten note stating, Turning in Wednesday, January 29th. At 2 a.m., had my fun at police, Black Doll the Avenger. The letter included a location. Police waited at the appointed time and place, but the author never showed. Afterwards, the alleged killer sent a note made of letters cut and pasted from magazines stating, Have changed my mind. You would not give me a square deal. Dahlia killing was justified. Once again, everything sent had been wiped clean with gasoline and no fingerprints were found. The letters stopped and as time went on, the Black Dahlia case went cold. After over 70 years, it remains open. However, a couple of intriguing and chilling theories have emerged, including a man who firmly believes that his father was the murderer and has some compelling evidence. Crime Fanatic Friday Part 2, The Black Dahlia Cold Case a man strongly believes that his father is the murderer in the 70-year-old Black Dahlia cold case. Shortly after his father's death in 1999, a now-retired LAPD detective, Steve Hodel, was going through his dad's belongings when he noticed two photos of a woman who bore striking resemblance to the 22-year-old victim Elizabeth Short. That's when he began to investigate his own deceased father. He went through countless testimonies, archives, and witness interviews from the case. He also had a handwriting expert compare samples of his father's writing to the writing on some of the notes that were sent to the press from the alleged killer. The analysis found a strong possibility that his father's handwriting matched, but the results were not conclusive. The Black Dahlia crime scene photos show that Short's body had been cut in a manner consistent with hemocorporectomy, a medical procedure that spices the body underneath the lumbar spine. Hodel's father had been a doctor who attended medical school where this procedure was taught in the 1930s. Hodel also found a folder in his father's archives at UCLA with receipts for contracting work on his childhood home, dated a few days before the murder for a large bag of concrete, the same brand and size found near Short's body. Hodel fact-checked the 2003 best-selling book, Black Dahlia Avenger, A True Story, against the official police files and found his father, George Hodel, to be on the list of the six main suspects that LABD had investigated. He was in fact so suspicious that they had bugged his home in 1950 to monitor his activities. An audio statement recorded, 8.25 p.m., woman screamed. Woman screamed again. It should be noted that the woman was not heard before the scream. Then, later that day, George Hodel was over her telling someone, realized there was nothing I could do, put a pillow over her head and cover her with a blanket. Expired 12.59. They thought there was something fishy. Anyway, now they may have figured it out. Killed her. Supposing I did kill Black Dahlia. They couldn't prove it now. They can't talk to my secretary anymore because she's dead. Even after this shocking revelation, hinting that he killed the Black Dahlia and also his secretary, the Black Dahlia case still hasn't been officially closed. Am I the asshole for telling my best friend that he deserved to get cheated on? Story time. My friend Steve has recently been having a lot of problems with his new girlfriend, Amy. They got together in like August time of this year and it's been an absolute train wreck ever since. And it's not Steve that's the issue. It's Amy. So despite Amy being an absolute idiot, Steve is just so infatuated with this girl. She's cheated on Steve multiple times and shown absolutely no remorse. And every single time she cheats on him, she gives him some random story about how Steve isn't giving her what she needs and that he's not being supported getting strange. She's even said before that she finds it really really attractive when Steve gets like super angry and jealous and Steve is such a mug 
that he just gobbles it up every time. Amy says that she acts like this because she never had a father figure, so she's got mad daddy issues. And Steve, bless him, is like, I just want to be there for her and help show that men are good and she does deserve to be treated right. So do you, Steve. You deserve to be treated right. Since, like, September time, Amy has been seeing this other guy who we'll call Dave. Amy is 100% in infatuated with Dave. And of course, Steve ain't happy about this. So he and Amy have been arguing a lot about Dave. They've been arguing a lot about this and Amy's POV is that if Steve can't accept her for 100% of who she is, then maybe they should just break up. Maybe she should just break up anyway, but here we are. So through this blackmail, Steve accepted this. And not just that, they have now entered what Steve calls a semi-open relationship in which Amy gets to see people she wants to see, but Steve isn't allowed to see anyone else. And this is because Amy fears that Steve will become emotionally invested in someone else. Amy Hon, hold up a mirror and look at yourself. So Steve has agreed to this, but he's been absolutely livid about it for months. But around November time, Amy started to see Dave more than she was seeing Steve. Steve just refuses and while Steve refuses to admit it to us, Amy is basically in a full-time relationship with this Dave guy. I've put too much foundation on. At this point, she really only has Steve in her life for money and emotional support when her and Dave have arguments. One time, Steve even gave Amy £200 so she could go to an expensive restaurant on a date with Dave. So fast forward to this week and I am back in my hometown after being away for a little while. So Steve texts me on a Saturday and he is like, I hate Dave. Yes, King. <laughs> he was talking about how he wants to get revenge for him stealing his girl. He basically wanted to turn up to Dave's house and he wanted me to go with him since all of our other friends couldn't. And I had literally just got back the day before, so I was absolutely exhausted, so I point blank refused. I told him that Leah was just an absolute lost cause and there was no way I was fighting anyone for someone that I'd never met before. I told him that I told him that Amy was an absolute lost cause and there would be absolutely no way I was going to fight anyone. Steve started getting all icky and begging me to help him, saying that Amy was the absolute love of his life and he needed me to come and get her back. So I refused again and he was like, fine, I'll just go on my own. And that was the last I heard of it, until the next morning. I kid you not, I woke up to like 300 messages from our friends. So long story short, Steve had actually gone over to Dave's place to go and get Amy back. But he ended up getting his ass handed to him by Dave. And to make it worse, this all went down in front of Amy. And at this point, I called Steve and I was like, listen, baby, you should probably speak to a lawyer. But he refused since Amy asked him to not say anything. I thought this boy just needs some sort of reality check. So I told him that he had been so dumb throughout this whole situation. And I think this was a little bit of a trigger for him because he got quite angry. He then started turning on me and said that I was a bitch and I was a snake for not supporting him. Then called me a fake friend, which is the last cause. You don't call me a fake friend. I was done at this point. I was done trying to be Mr. Nice Guy. So I was like, listen, Steve, you kind of deserved all of this. And it kind of makes sense why Amy prefers Dave over you now. I may have been taking it a little bit too far. He then hung up on me and we literally haven't spoken since. So what do you think? Am I wrong here? I the asshole for asking my fiancé to not wear his brother's necklace on our wedding day. Story time. My fiancé Steve's brother passed away a fair few years ago now. And he likes to wear his brother's ring on his right hand. And he also has a necklace of his that he really likes to wear as well. Do you know what? I can get behind the ring because you don't really notice it that much. But the necklace is very, very noticeable. It's quite big. So on this necklace, it has his brother's initials, his brother's wife's initials and his brother's daughter's initials. So we were talking about our wedding and I asked him, if he would consider taking off the necklace just for our wedding day because I have this necklace that my mum got me that I won't be wearing because it just doesn't go in my dress. My thoughts are is it's just one day and he is more than welcome to wear the ring if he wants still. It's just one day and he can wear the ring still if he wants but my fiance outright refused. Said it's the only thing that he has of his brothers and that he wants his brother to be with him on his day which I understand but you've got his ring. So what do you think? Am I the arsehole? I very rarely give my opinion on this situation, but I'm going to today. It's my page, I can do what I want. Uh, yeah, yeah, you are the arsehole. What the fuck? Because also, you're not going to be able to see it unless your fiancé is topless for the wedding. Now, listen, I'm not judging, but not very, you know, not really seen that very much. 
then you're not even going to see the necklace anyway. I think you've got an issue with the brother. Comparing the necklace that your mum got you as a gift compared to his late brother's necklace is not the same thing. It's also his wedding too. He should be allowed to wear what he wants. So hate to break it to you, sweetie, but you are the asshole.